So this is kind of the overarching beliefs that will shape how you run your business. So that's what core beliefs are. And I think when when you think about it that way, you can understand their power. Because if you have a core set of beliefs that are true in every part of your business, it's going to be very easy for you to simply say, okay, I have these guiding principles. I can run my business in an easy way. Welcome to the Online Genius Podcast, where host and renegade thinking beer brewing lawyer turned online entrepreneur Bobby Klink proves that building and protecting your online genius doesn't have to be rocket science. Bobby and his expert guests break down online marketing and the legal stuff so you can stop sweating the small stuff and get back to building your amazing business. Now, here's your host, Bobby Klink. Hey there. Welcome to episode 86 of the Online Genius Podcast. I'm your host, Bobby Klink, and I am really stoked for today's episode. Because in today's episode, I'm going to be talking about some things that I think are pretty darn important to your business, to my business, et cetera. Specifically, I'm going to be talking about core beliefs. And we're going to talk about why core beliefs are important, why I think that they are something critical that you need to have in your business. And then I'm going to talk to you about the seven core beliefs that I use to run my business. Now, I'm going to tell you, like a lot of things, I kind of stumbled upon these core beliefs. But when I've looked back over time and decided and and thought through, these are the things that I, I do and I try to do all the time. I have to be honest, sometimes I lose my way, but they're kind of the guideposts that I use in my business and I formalize them into core beliefs and my fans first society members shout out to you 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 know these things these are the core beliefs that we've talked about there in the membership and so these are things that i believe are crucial for me to actually build my business and to have the success i've had in my business and so that's why i want to talk about them and i want to lay them out for you but Before we get to the episode, this week's podcast, as always, is brought to you by the Online Genius Podcast community on Facebook. I love coming here. I love chatting with you, but I really want to engage with you. I want to connect with you. I want to have conversations with you, not just talk at you. And I can't do that on a podcast. All I can do here is talk at you. And so I would love for you to join me in the community because that's where we can have meaningful conversations about these core beliefs, about other business things, about marketing things, about, you know, what I'm talking a lot about these days, about how to find and and really kind of cultivate a group of true fans who really are ready to buy anything and everything you have to offer. So we can do that in the community. It's absolutely free. You can join by going to youronlinegenius.com forward slash community. Again, youronlinegenius.com forward slash community. So with that, let's dive in. Now, before I talk about the, the core beliefs in my business, I want to talk about where they fit in, and why you should adopt core beliefs in your business. The concept of a core belief is pretty simple, right? It's something that you believe to your core that should guide you, et cetera. The reason why core beliefs, I believe, are so important is because in our everyday life, we have to make decisions all the time. We're deciding things. We're doing things, et cetera. And the problem is if you have to really kind of think all the time and and, and try to make a meaningful decision each time, it's going to overwhelm you and you're going to end up not knowing what to do and and your decisions will be haphazard and you're not going to actually be consistent. Whereas if you adopt a set of core beliefs and really internalize them, these aren't things like platitudes that you – put up on the wall somewhere. These are things that are inside of you that you really do believe and make part of the core of who you are. Decisions become easy 
because in a sense, you already have these core beliefs that set out your decision matrix for you. So when you come to have to make a decision, all you have to say is, well, okay, well, let me think about that. And you don't even have to think about it. And we'll talk about one of these specifically. You know, one of the things that that is my core belief is serve first. And, and, and I'll talk about that when we get to the section. But you'll get this because I've talked about it. I am now at a point where I have realized that in a sense, over the last 18 months, the more I give, the more I get. In other words, the more I simply say, I'm just going to serve my people and I'm not going to worry. I'm not going to expect to get anything back. The more I do that, the better things turn out. And so because that's one of my core beliefs, and again, I'm going to get into a, a lot more when we talk about the specific ones, I have this, this kind of – this, you know, something I can look at and when I'm trying to make a decision, I can simply say, well, okay, I should give more and, and, and okay, I should give more. And again, you, when you have that internalized, decisions get to be easy and you don't have to think hard. You don't have to, you know, spend your time, et cetera, doing it. Now, maybe I'm kind of crazy and I like the idea of core whatever, beliefs, theories, what, you know, whatever you want to call it. And maybe that goes back to law school because I have to counsel in many phases of my life, I have had to counsel my clients that, hey, we have to adopt a core message, a core theory, a core here is what our case is about. Well, I think we ought to be able to do the same things about our business. Here are the things that I believe. Put you know a line in the sand, put your foot down, say, these are the things that I truly believe. So I want to encourage you, whether you like the core beliefs that I'm going to talk about, or not, I believe that every entrepreneur should adopt their own set of core beliefs. And what I want to be clear about is what these are. These are not beliefs about your internal team. That's something different. Like if you're building a team of employees, that's a different thing. These are beliefs about how you run your business generally, about how you approach business and that is – that's what I'm talking about here. So I want you to understand that these are things that kind of pervade every part of your business from how you work with your team, how you treat your customers, how you treat fans, how you interact with peers, how you interact with everybody along the way. So this is kind of the the, the overarching beliefs that will shape – how you run your business. So that's what core beliefs are. And I think when when you think about it that way, you can understand their power. Because if you have a core set of beliefs that are true in every part of your business, it's going to be very easy for you to simply say, okay, I have these guiding principles. I can run my business in an easy way. So that's the value of them. Now, I want to talk about the seven core beliefs that I use to run my business. And again, as I said earlier, I can't claim to have been some genius who thought these things up at the beginning. But quite honestly, if I had simply created a a set of core beliefs at the beginning of my business, they would have been a bunch of BS. They would have been platitudes. These are the core beliefs that I have adopted over the last 18 months or so And some of them earlier than others, some of them I've played with a little bit more, some of them I I had very early on. Some of them are things that quite honestly, I should have learned a long time ago, but it took me a while to figure out. But these are the things that as I sit here today, I can look back and say, no question, these are the things that I believe. And is there a chance that in the future, I may want to add one or two? Sure. But I think this is a pretty good set of what will be my core beliefs for the long term. So let's talk about core belief number one. And this is number one for a reason. Core belief number one is that business should be fun. This is one that somehow it took me a while to get. And I want to be clear. I don't mean that there aren't going to be tough days. I don't mean that every waking minute of your business is going to be fun. What I mean is that by and large, the work you do, the people you serve, everything you do, you should enjoy. And 
The reason why I believe this is so important is let's be honest. We are going to have to put in a lot of work, especially when you're starting out. You're going to be the chief cook and bottle washer. You're going to do everything in your business. And actually building a business isn't easy. You're going to have to actually spend a lot of time doing a lot of things. You'll have to, for example, sometimes work late on Friday nights or over the weekends, et cetera. No matter what anybody says, that's reality. And during launch times, there's going to be a ton of pressure on you and you're going to have to be coming in and working long hours. Well, guess what? If you're not having a good time, if you're not enjoying yourself, if you don't like your business generally, if you don't like the people you serve, if you don't like your peers in the industry, you're not going to do it. It really is just that simple. And I think about this now, and it's kind of funny because we probably all heard that that old adage that if you like what you do, you never work a day in your life. And again, my dad told me and my brother that forever. And and I, I kind of said, oh, yeah, yeah. And I thought I liked what I did before as a lawyer. But looking back, I didn't. I wasn't having fun. Sure, were there moments that were fun? Yes. But a lot of the time, I wasn't having fun. I didn't want to spend time with the people who were part of my business. For example, you know, my peers and my clients and all that. That wasn't, you know, who I I hung out with and it wasn't what I enjoyed doing. The idea of going to like a mixer with a bunch of lawyers, I mean, it, it is honestly hard for me to imagine something that is more horrifying to me than going to like a networking event with a bunch of lawyers. and. I'm not saying that's right for everybody or wrong for everybody, but for me, I wasn't enjoying myself. I wasn't having fun. And so I can think back to early in my career when I worked at these big firms and I was making good money and all this. I mean, I would come home and I had to do something to have fun because my job wasn't enjoyable. Well, nowadays, on the other hand, I honestly feel like when I get up, and come to work in the online space, I'm getting to come and hang out with friends and have a good time. And am I working? Of course I am. Am I doing things to be productive? Of course I am. But like the things that I have to do to build my business are fun for me. When I get to like interview people for a podcast, a lot of fun. When I get to go into other people's podcasts and talk, I love it. When I get to go into Facebook groups, whether mine or somebody else's, and interact with people, and as I I like to call it, cause trouble, I love it. When I get to think through like funnels and, and, and marketing issues and figure out how to potentially sell things, do I enjoy it? I love it. Writing sales emails, writing my weekly emails, all that stuff is stuff that I actually enjoy doing. Now, I want to be clear. I'm not saying that you have to enjoy every piece of your business. There are going to be things that you don't enjoy. There are going to be things that you're going to want to outsource, that you're going to want to bring people in to help you with, and that is fine. But there are some core things that you need to enjoy and need to be fun for you. You need to enjoy the people you serve. It needs to be fun to interact with your customers. If it's not, you're going to have a problem. Similarly, if you are going to succeed, you need to enjoy your peers in the industry. So people who you might have, you know, you know, partnerships with or might, you know, talk to them about, you know, doing things together, et cetera. You've got to be do- enjoying that because if you're not, you're not going to put in the time. It's just a reality. I've seen it way too many times. <laughs> I joke a lot with people that I almost started a beer company and I did. That's not a joke. I was, you know, this close a few years ago and then law firm work got in the way. But as I look back, it would not have been a good thing for me. Because I love beer, I love craft beer, but I got to be honest with you, I'm not sure I like a lot of the craft beer people that I would have had to hang out with because I have a very different view <laughs> about what you know craft beer ought to be. I don't know. I just – I convey that as, as a thought. But aside from actually allowing you to kind of you know put in the time which you're going to need to put in, when business is fun for you, you will become magnetic to people. When you're having a good time, when you're making things enjoyable, when things are easy for you, guess what? People are going to be drawn to you. When you're not having a good time, 
when you're grumpy, when you're you know upset about everything, people are going to be repelled. And so part of the value of having fun in your business is that it will draw people to you. And so that is my core belief. Business should be fun. And so I kind of look at it now and, and, and I don't really have to do an analysis now. And I don't think of this as everything I do has to be fun. But if at some point it gets to the point that I'm not having fun or I'm you know consistently in a, in a, a state of being annoyed, that's going to be a sign I need to change something about my business. So I kind of use that as a barometer. And also, I try to bring fun to things and make things light and fun for people. So core belief number one is business should be fun. That takes me to core belief number two, serve first. Now, this, candidly, a lot of people say it, but I think a lot of people use it as a platitude because a lot of people say it, but then if you talk to them, the people on their list are leads and, you know, they they talk about, well, I, w- I want to serve first because, <laughs> you know, if you really dig down, they're serving first purely because they want to get something back. That's not what serve first means. Now, to actually serve first means that you serve not just first and not just to get something. It means that you give willingly cheerfully and non-expectantly. In other words, you're not giving or serving so that you get something in return. You're giving, you're serving because you want to give and you want to serve. This was kind of one of the, the big revelations I had in 2018. And it has been the most important revelation in a sense of how I approach things. Again, having fun, I put first because I believe that is an important metric for all of us. And it actually fits in here. But actually adopting what I call an approach of radical giving in business has been core to my success. It has been a key to what has driven my success over the last 18 months. There simply is no way around that. I give and, and, Again, it's this really strange thing to explain because by giving non-expectantly, meaning giving without any expectation that it's going to do any good for me or get me anything, that is the kind of giving that actually results in you getting more from the universe, from the world, whatever you want to call it. You could call it the law of attraction or you could simply call it by giving, you are becoming magnetic again because When people see you give radically, give without expectation, when people see that, they are drawn to you. And when they are drawn to you, they they want to do business with you. They, they, They feel like they know you. They trust you immediately and they like you. There is nothing more important than giving. Now, you've heard me talk about this. If you've been with me for the in this podcast for a while, you've heard me talk about it before and I'm going to continue talking about it. Because I honestly believe this is one of the most important things that we should all be doing in our business. Now, in my Fans First Society, it's not required reading, but in that membership, I highly recommend that people read The Go-Giver. And I recommend it to a lot of people. But as I'm recording this, the Fans First Society has been open for just over two weeks. And I've already had multiple people tell me that me having them read that book has put things into perspective for them in a way that is hard for them to describe. So I would encourage you to go out and buy that book, The Go-Giver. I'm not an affiliate. I don't care where you buy it. It is a short parable that when I look back at it, and again, this is one of those things, I stumbled into it. (laughs) I I was doing this before I read The Go-Giver, but when I read The Go-Giver, it put kind of a a container around what I was doing. But I will tell you, it did actually push me to give even more. What I mean by that is I now regularly refer people to other lawyers who serve online entrepreneurs. If someone comes to me and says, hey, I've got an issue that's really about kind of health, like about health law or health coaching, very specific about that. I say, you know what? I could talk to you, but quite honestly, let me send you to this other person 
who actually, she is a health coach and she used to be a lawyer who served healthcare companies. So I bet you she can serve you better than I can. And when people come to me from the UK and say, hey, are your templates working? I say, they're a good start, but let me send you this other woman first to check because I know she's in the UK. She's a lawyer and I think she's doing the same thing that I do. That's an example of serving first, of radical giving. The point is that to me, serving a person, a fan, a lead, a prospect, whatever you want to call them, they are a person. And they're they're a person to me regardless of whether I'm ever going to sell a single product to them. And I want to serve them the best way I can regardless of whether I'm going to make a dime from it now or in the future. And I do it because it's the right thing to do. But I also have found that the more I do it, and again, this is that weird thing. You can't be doing it because you want to get something. But the more I do it, the better results I get. That's why I decided you know, to start giving my privacy policy template away for free rather than charging people for it. Candidly, I was, you know, a lot of people in my life, including the people in my mastermind, had to like pull me back from the edge of giving even more templates away for free. They said, no, no, stop. You're being crazy. And, you know, it's this thing that I have found over and over and over again to be true. The more that I'm willing to serve, that I'm willing to give, that I'm willing to do these things with no expectation of getting anything back, the better my business does. And often it's it, it's collateral effects. It, it's not the person you serve necessarily who, who buys from you. It's someone else who saw you do it and says, I can't believe I saw him just do that. So that's my second core belief. Serve first and you got to mean it. It can't be this platitude that everybody says. You have to internalize it and do it. Now, core belief number three is more cowbell. <laughs> and if this is if, if you've been with me a while, you know this reference. If you don't, let me explain it. It comes back to one of my friends who I met through taking B-School, Marie Forleo's B-School, but I signed up through Amy Porterfield. And so I was in this group. This again was in 2018. I was in this group in everyone who had signed up for B-School through Amy Porterfield. And I had interviewed for the podcast the guy who – I don't remember what his role is, but he is an executive at Animoto, a video company. And so I decided, hey, I'm going to mess around with it and I'm going to create a video for my law firm at the time that was going to be about how you know online entrepreneurs need a different kind of lawyer was the concept. And so it was kind of playful and so I created it and I then you know put it up. And I used mainly stock images or stock images, stock video – And it kind of had a picture of me at the end. So I I posted in the group to get comments. And this one woman who, you know, I'm sure I'd probably interacted with her before then, but I'm not sure that I had. Her name's Melanie. She said, well, it's good, but it, it, it needs something. And then she posted this famous Saturday Night Live skit with Christopher Walken as a music producer saying that this music needed more cowbell. Of course, the joke of that is no music ever needs more cowbell. But what she was saying is that my video needed more cowbell. And then she said, and the cowbell is you. So when I say more cowbell, what I mean is that we are all personal brands. If you are an information-based business, I don't care whether you use your, your name or not as your brand name. We are personal brands. And that means that ultimately people are going to do business with us because of us, not because of a brand name, not because of something else. And so we need to put more of ourselves into our brands. That means being authentic. That means being willing to be open, to be vulnerable, et cetera. The more cowbell concept is the reason why I share painful stories sometimes in my weekly emails. In one that went out not too long ago, I shared the story of my dad being in a plane crash a week and a half before the start of my third year in law school and how I had to make some really hard decisions about what I was going to do in my life. And I do that because I want to let the people who are my fans, potential customers, et cetera, into my life. 
And I recognize that the more I do that, the better my business does. Now, you can't let people in and just have it be a cluster, meaning it can't just be my whole life is foobar and I'm just going to, you know, have this, you know, complete mess open for everyone to show. That's not going to work, right? Because people don't want to hear about all your problems all the time. But letting people in on who you are, being authentic, being vulnerable, actually being yourself is going to draw the right people to you. Now it's going to repel some people. Quite honestly, that that email I sent where I told the story of, of my dad being in a plane crash, it was, I think, the second most spam complaints of any email I've ever sent. There was no promotion in it. There was nothing. But clearly, some people didn't want to hear that. And that's okay. I, I don't mind. I celebrate that people unsubscribe from my list because I'm not their kind of guy. Because I don't want to get everybody. I want to attract the right people. And the only way I can do that is to put myself into my brand. And so it's about being authentic. It's about, you know, being open, being vulnerable. But it's also about being cheeky and lighthearted because that's who I am. And people might as well know that because if that's not what they want, I'm not their guy, right? I mean, you know, if they want someone who's serious and buttoned up and lawyer man, that's not me. Never will be me. If that's what you expect, you shouldn't be around me because, you know, <laughs> you're going to be let down. And so the more we add ourselves in, and we do this by telling funny personal stories and anecdotes and things like that, and the more you do that, the more you're going to connect with people, and the more you connect with people, the more you're going to, you know, succeed. Because connection is how people get to know, like, and trust you. And so it will be how, you know, people get to the point of actually wanting to buy from you. So that's core belief number three, more cowbell, which is my way of saying, add yourself to your brand. And again, I want to be clear on this. This is not about fake authenticity. Fake authenticity is crap. I'm talking real authenticity. I'm talking about being willing to cry if that's who you are. I'm talking about truly opening up. Now, you got to figure out where your line is, but I would push you to add more of yourself to your brand. Okay, so now that was a serious subject. Now let's talk about core belief number four, and this is be a cheerleader. It took me again a while to get this, but you know what? People don't want to be around negative people. Generally, most people, I should say, don't want to be around negative, toxic people. They want to be around positive people, people who are supportive, people who are helping, people who make them feel good. And the funny thing is, I really got this because I kind of like that. But, you know, for a long time, I was a negative person. You know, I, I think I had some predisposition to that. Part of my upbringing, you know, candidly, my dad, is a very negative person, sees the potential problems everywhere. But you know what? Being a lawyer kind of heightens that because as a lawyer, my job often was to try to find problems and avoid problems. And so, you know, that was where I was for a long time. And I've told this story many a time, but I'm going to tell it again. Things changed for me because of a silly little engagement contest thought up by a woman named Angie Klein, who was Amy Porterfield's community manager for 2018 and then, you know, for part of this year in 2019. I was in this pop-up group that she was running, that Amy was running for considering B-School last year, and they decided to run an engagement contest. And (laughs) me being a type A lawyer, I said, contest? Challenge accepted. And so I was going to win. But the problem was there weren't a lot of legal questions, you know, so I kind of said, hey, I got to just post, you know, I got to respond to people. So I started being supportive and being, you know, a positive guy. I mean, I did other stuff. I also posted, you know, substantive comments for people and things like that. But I just started being a cheerleader. And when I did, something changed inside of me. 
It was almost like, you know, that moment where the Grinch gets a heart. <laughs> what I don't remember exactly what it is. It was the same kind of thing for me. Something like a switch flipped in me, in my personality and everything. And so I started doing it. And this is like a weird thing that happens. But I was doing this online. I mean, that, that's where all this was. And strangely, like I found I really enjoyed doing it. So I kept doing it even though I, after I won the, the week's, one week's engagement award. So I couldn't win it again. But I kept doing it because it made me feel good. And then the other thing that happened was literally like a couple weeks after it started, I was sitting on my back patio with friends and my wife and some people commented. They said that I seemed different. Literally, this one little act of deciding to be a cheerleader, and again, I thought it was just happening online, but that small little shift changed my overall disposition, changed how people related to me, changed how people viewed me, including people in my real world life, not just my online life. And so I've continued to do it and people are always blown away at at how I am supportive and I am those things. And so if you think about the notion that in our business, it's all about the no like, and trust factor, well, If people see you as supportive, they're going to like you and it's going to help you along the way. So being a cheerleader and helping people and being supportive is one of the quickest ways to build that with people. So that is my core belief. Number four, be a cheerleader. I try to do that every day. I try to spend some time every day finding someone to support, to just give some, some positive feedback to. So let's move to core belief number five. This is one I like. Keep it simple, stupid. And again, a lot of people say, oh, don't call, don't say stupid. Well, you know, back to core belief number three, more cowbell. I say keep it simple, stupid. <laughs> it's a phrase I use all the time and I'm going to use it online. But the point here is that we, I mean, humans try to make everything complicated. And online entrepreneurs are pretty bad at that too. And part of it is that we we know a lot. We've learned a lot. And so a lot of times we feel like we have to try to apply all of that. So for example, you know, maybe, maybe you, you've heard about upsells and downsells and, and self-liquidating offers and one-time offers and a challenge and a webinar and, and a product launch formula. And so you feel like, well, I got to do all this and, and I've got to have a course and a membership and, and, and oh, I, gotta, I need to have a group coaching program. Ooh, and a mastermind. And I see so many entrepreneurs do that and they tie themselves in knots because they're making everything complicated. And the reality is that oftentimes, and I shouldn't just say oftentimes, the most successful entrepreneurs, if you look at them, they generally keep things simple. Now, they have learned a lot about a lot of different things, but Their power is in understanding that just because you know something doesn't mean you have to use it. Just because you have a concept doesn't mean you have to apply it. Just because you know how to create a membership doesn't mean you create a membership. Just because you know how to do a challenge, a webinar, and a product launch formula doesn't mean you do all of them. Often, the best thing to do is simply to say, what's the simplest way to crack this nut and to do it? Now, in in science, there's the concept of Occam's razor, which is that generally, if you have multiple explanations, the simplest one is the best one and will will actually be the correct one. Well, I kind of like to apply the same principle in business. I'm going to start with the simplest idea, route, whatever. And then if it doesn't work, maybe I add some layers of complexity to it. So when I start building a funnel, I keep it simple. I might then add some bells and whistles later, but I don't add them at the beginning. (laughs) And, you know, some of this is simply, you know, I think it's good for my mental bandwidth and it will be for yours too, because if you try to overthink these things, you can, you know, tie yourself in knots, but it's also for customer experience. I, I was thinking about this recently when I bought a product and I bought this product. I don't remember even which, what product it was. It was some software as a service, as I recall, but I bought access to it. And it was one of those classic funnels that 
I see people get when they go through a, a, a certain software that has a culture associated with it where when you buy something, literally I had to click through like there were like five one-time offer upsells associated with it. And literally, not only were they associated with it, but I had to scroll down to the bottom of each one of those pages to say no. Well, guess what? If that were a product that were, say, something like a membership where I would, you know, have to, you know, decide each month whether to stay, or if that were a company where, you know, they had, I'd bought one product and I maybe in the future might want to consider buying another product from them, that experience would prevent me from ever doing it. Now, I don't mind someone offering an upsell. I don't mind someone offering a downsell. But if you're going to make me say no to you seven freaking times after I buy a product from you, you've just told me that all you care about is my money. You've just told me that, you know, you don't see me as a person. You see me as an ATM machine. And so that's an example of how sometimes making these complicated things also is bad for your business. But also I've talked about this with launching. Sometimes we want to try to do really complicated things during launches and we don't have to. Now, I want to be clear. I'm not suggesting that you should not use a webinar or a product launch formula or a a challenge. For most information-based products, you need some kind of launch vehicle. You have to show people what your teaching style is so that they'll get a sense of who you are. But don't overcomplicate things. Don't make it this, you know, gargantuan effort in your head. Let's work on keeping it simple. And so again, keep it simple, stupid is an important one for me. And I have to be reminded of it all the time. But I think every entrepreneur could learn from that. That takes me to core belief number six. And this is that I do unscalable things. In today's online world, everyone seems to be focused on outsourcing, on delegating, on automating, on templatizing, on all of those things. And I'm not saying you can't do some of that. In fact, you should do some of that. But you know what? Most people are doing way too much of it. Most people have basically gone overboard on this. And so kind of they lose the ability to connect with people, to engage with people. And it's all in this process of they want everything to be scalable. Let me be clear. Some things should be scalable, right? I mean, if you want to build a business long-term that's going to allow you to have kind of the, the kind of life you probably want without constantly being on the hamster wheel, you're going to have to build some kind of scalable business, whether it's having people working for you, serving clients, or you know, building something like a course or a membership so that you are actually selling a product that is not tied to time. You're going to have to do that if you really want to kind of get some freedom in your life and your business. But you know what? Focusing on everything being scalable, if, if I did that, I would have been a flop. Because if I did that, I, I, I sure as heck wouldn't spend a bunch of time in Facebook groups giving value to people because that's not scalable. But you know what? That has been some of the most important work I have done over the last 18 months. And, and I feel very certain there are some people listening to this who have seen me do it and are nodding their heads right now saying, yep, no question you know, I'm betting that some of the people on who are listening to this right now, they're only here because they saw me do that. In fact, I, I would gather, I would be willing to say that the majority of my audience comes to me having seen that, at least the people who are active and engaged. And so I believe that we need to pull back from this whole let's scale, let's, let's systematize, let's delegate, let's outsource, let's automate stuff. Now, automate the stuff that you can automate, like routine posts. So in my, my Fans First memberships site, there are three posts that go out every week. Well, yes, I'm going to automate that, right? Because they're the same post every single week. The point is for accountability and for, for celebrating wins, right? So, hey, that makes sense. Let's go ahead and automate that. But you know what? Taking time to, to drop in and say hi, yeah, I'm going to do that. You know, that isn't scalable. But again, even though it's not scalable, it has some value. 
let me give you another example of something that's not scalable. I had someone send me an email recently thinking they'd made a mistake by buying one of my products. And it was a big, long email. And you know what? Most people might have simply responded either, you know, by saying, okay, fine, I'll give you a refund here. Or respond and say, well, there is no refund. So too bad, too so sad. Or maybe they don't respond at all. I responded with a very long, heartfelt response where I was trying to, to explain and provide value. And I said, look, here's what I propose. I said, look, I don't want you to be here if you don't want to be here, but why don't we, you know, give it a try. And if it doesn't work, let me know and I'll give you a refund. And I, and I did that. And I don't know how much time I spent on that, but I spent enough time that it probably wasn't worth my time to do it. But the reality is that person felt cared for. That person felt heard. And that is an example of something that is not scalable at all. No one else saw that, but I am a true believer that doing those kinds of things will propel my business forward. And maybe it's because that woman, maybe she asked for a refund after, you know, after a while, but she says, you know, this, you know, Bobby actually cares. And so if I offer something later that resonates with her, she'll be more likely to buy. But also if she's talking to someone else and she thinks that I'm a right fit for him, guess what? She'll probably recommend him to me in a heartbeat because she'll say, I know that Bobby actually cares about his people. I know that Bobby will take care of this person if I send them that way. And the only way to show people that is to truly care. Now, and again, I don't want to go overboard at some point, some stuff needs to be, you know, automated, delegated, et cetera, right? I, as I'm recording this, I've just hired an employee. And so, you know, some of the stuff is going to be, I'm going to have her handle. For example, I get questions, you know, not all the time, but maybe once a week, people ask me how to change their credit card information on their ongoing billing payments. And, you know, so that's the kind of stuff because even if I respond, it's it's, it's basically I, I go and create a template and I respond and I'm not putting any personalization into it. There's no reason why that can't be done by a team. And there's no reason that you can't have a team addressing, you know, helping answer questions and do things like that. But at the same time, finding ways that are not scalable, where you actually are connecting one-on-one -on -one with your fans, potential fans, et cetera, that is going to, to pay dividends over the long term. So, you know, this core belief number six is that, you know, I do unscalable things and I'm not going to try to delegate, automate, templatize, and, you know, then do all of that. I'm actually going to continue to do some of those things. So that takes me to the final core belief, which is focus on what matters. Now, I did an episode a while back with Perry Marshall about the 80-20 rule, and that episode has some power in it because, I think too many people worry about the 80%. And what I'm talking about is the 80% of the work that isn't going to move the needle. The 80% of the people who aren't going to matter. And, and I've seen a lot of friends talk about this. You know, so many people are worried about trying to, you know, grow their Instagram followers, for example, but they're not actually worried about serving the people who are already following them. Or I see so many people fixated on all the people who don't open their emails, but they don't think about the 30% who open their emails and who open their emails maybe like religiously every week. You know what? I focus on that. I focus on the fact that, you know, over a thousand people open my email every week and are served by me. I focus on the fact that I'm quite certain there are three to 500 people who probably open every single email I send them. And you know what? I want to serve those three to 500 people. Those are the people I worry about. But it's also about the other things in your business. And we need to get in the practice of thinking through what is the, the, the highest value work I can be doing. That's part of why I've hired someone because candidly, I wasn't doing that for a long time. I was, you know, doing things like putting splash pages on videos the day before they had to go live, you know, and that is not a good use of my time, but I've been doing that, but we all need to focus on the things that matter and the highest value work in our business and spend our time doing that. 
So this is one of my core beliefs. It is part of my belief system, but I admit I need to improve on it. Now, now I, I've got the 80-20 rule of only you know, focusing on serving the people who matter, but I need to focus on only doing the work that matters and not spending my time doing the other work. So that's a place I need to improve, and, and I'm very open about that with people. But you need to do the same thing. You need to focus on what matters in your business. So that's it. Those are the seven core beliefs of my business. Number one, business should be fun. Number two, serve first. Number three, more cowbell, which means add more of yourself to your brand. Number four, be a cheerleader. Number five, keep it simple, stupid. Number six, do the unscalable. And number seven, focus on what matters. Now, I think this is a pretty good set of core beliefs that pretty much every entrepreneur could adopt and would have a good business as a result of. But regardless of what you do, I encourage you to create and adopt your own set of core beliefs. Doing so will make it very easy for you to to kind of run your business, to know what to do, because you'll have these these you know core beliefs that guide you in what you do. So that's my call to action to you this week is you know figure out what your core beliefs are and do that and you will be better off. And I would love to hear your feedback, whether it's in the community, which you can join by heading to youronlinegenius.com forward slash community, or tag me on Instagram. I'm just Bobby Clank. You know, tag me in, in a story and talk about what your core beliefs are. I'd love to hear them. Because I like hearing what other people believe and what their views are. You know, maybe we have a spirited discussion and maybe we, you know, <laughs> you convince me to, to adopt one or maybe we, you don't. But you know what? It'll be fun to have that conversation. And so I would love for you to do that and let me know, you know, what your core beliefs are and then we can have that discussion. So that's it for this week's episode of the Online Genius Podcast. I'll be back next week with another episode. Thanks for listening to the Online Genius Podcast. Make sure to tune in next week for more great tips, tricks, and strategies to help you build and protect your online genius.